with everybody. We're filming for the first time today. Um, does anybody have any objections to being filmed? Huh? <laughs> we. We, we can airbrush you, it's fine. And, um, so, um, some, some of you would have seen uh, our speaker of tonight before, but not talking about the sorts of things uh, that he's talking about today. Um, so, it's so a very old friend of mine. Um, we, we go back, what is it, like 15 years, something like this? Yeah. Um, uh, did this is lots of different things to different people. Um, when I met him, he was... Um, he was a security developer professional, mm -hmm. so um, used to do all these exploits in, um, in banking networks and things like this. He's also one of the uh, founders of OWASP, so if any of you guys have used any of their tools before, he's been heavily involved from startup, um, runs chapters in West London, yeah. and does all these international conferences. Um, the first time that he spoke for the Azure user group, he created a bit of a stir because it was on the on the eve of the release of Azure websites, and uh, he thought it would be quite fun to hack it. And then a few people, a few people came along and announced it, and then there was a whole big shitstorm in Microsoft, and a few people were kicked because uh, it was quite, quite a serious flaw, wasn't it? Um, yeah. being, able to, being able to see all other people's files on, uh, on shared websites, multi-tenancy, it works really well in the cloud. Um, but, uh, but you know, this is, this is exactly what we need to make sure that we've got good, secure software and that we have proper process and to keep people in check who don't quite have the process off pat. I'm going to look at Mike again because uh, he's our Microsoft representative. So whenever anything goes wrong, um, if any of you have got complaints... <laughs> um, but, but I think um, I was, I was this is a very different talk and I was really keen um, to have Dennis speak about it because um, it's com coming, from, coming from doing a, a lot of children's events and teaching kids how to code Minecraft and Python and you get, you get into the sort of understanding of what makes them tick and how some of them want an easy ride, even though they like coding and they like doing all these things, they don't really understand all the building blocks that you need to understand today. And they want, they want that sort of easy path. Um, this, this book for me was very, very easy reading. Um, I managed to uh, read it in about three hours. It's not, a, it's not a complicated book. It's a very, very easy read about the philosophy of, um, of how the next generation of developers should think. But, um, but it's also, I think, a blueprint for us because it just reaffirms things that we should be, we should understand. You know, like the advent of the Free Software Foundation and how, how the open source movement um, started. And it puts into check all the sorts of tools that you should be using and be understanding day to day to be a more effective developer. So um, if any of you haven't got kids or don't use Code Club or anything like that, you'll still get loads out of this because it's really a blueprint about how we should be as developers. So what, what I want to talk about is I want to cover some of the topics I, I mentioned in the book. I want to talk about how I approach this. Uh, since I, I think you guys have a technical audience, I want to show some interesting demos. And I will frame it around the ideas of the book, because I think that makes a bit more interesting. And to show some of the things I'm working on and, and how I approach um, my, my challenges. So just quickly, I'm, I think I'm a security geek. I, I have been developing since I was a kid. I'm from the Spectrum generation. If you remember that one, and then the Amiga, and then the x86, and then the 286, and then the 486. And then we stopped counting at Pentium because it kind of became boring. And then and all the way to the thing. I kind of think in graphs, as in nodes, and you'll see this is a very common theme, and I will highly recommend you to start to, to think like this, because it, it, it makes a big difference how you approach things. I'm very passionate about learning. Uh, I've done a lot of training to developers and to all sorts of um, audiences. And uh, I'm passionate about using code to scale and solve problems. I kind of feel that that's kind of the stuff that I do. And I, I, I always found that, I, I always like to say that everybody needs to code. And I, and I realized recently that the reason why a lot of people get an allergic reaction when I say that, because I will go that, you know, from, you know, it's almost like there's nobody that I don't think should be able to code because the same thing that you say, there's nobody who should know maths and nobody should know how to use the internet. And I realized most, 
For a non-very technical person, coding is what the hardcore developers do. <coughs> the problem is that that's like saying you need to learn better maths, and you say, well, I don't want to do a PhD rocket analysis and calculations right over there, PhD, you know, PhD kind of math level. And that's the equivalent of a hardcore developer. Right? The hardcore developer is almost like some of the most complicated developments that you can do. So I actually think that I look, what I call by coding and development is automation, your, automating your workflows. It's, doing, it's basically refactoring your life in a way that makes you more effective. So, because that's what real coding is, right? Real coding actually is not creating super complicated pieces of code that nobody understands, right? That's actually a vulnerability in my book, right? I've created vulnerabilities because there's a piece of code that nobody understands. I says, well, guess what happens when there's a bug and somebody has to fix that thing, right? Or you're saying, here's a piece of, of code that you don't understand the behavior that runs half your business, right? So, um, I, I think that this ability to programmatically use technology to automate your life and to improve you is fundamental, especially <laughs> since the, there's massive techno, uh, tectonic plates shifting in the technologies that we have access to in a way that we didn't have even five or 10 years ago. And with machine learning uh, and AI when he arrives, but we don't have that yet, but with machine, the, the techniques of machine learning and, and scaling in the cloud, the paradigm shifts are very different. I do stuff now in hours or days that it would take me months or years to do before, right? which is a big difference. I'm also the, the Chief security, Information Security Officer of Photobox Group. Some of you might know. Um, well, it has Photobox, it has Moonpig, it has uh, Moonpig, so Hoffman Post and Grits in Spain, Germany, and Holland. And, and yeah, this is all my personal views, right? But um, um, it's, it's really interesting now to apply all my development and all my thinking to an organization. So I, I feel that what I do at my more management level now is I apply the same principles that I did when I was doing security or when I was doing development. It's just that the abstraction layers are a little bit different. Um, I also read, I wrote these presentations, which you might find interesting, from chaos engineering to credit graph press organization to the Hacking Porch was a really cool presentation because I was presenting in Portugal in between jobs and I was invited to go there and there was nobody who got pissed off if I said anything. So it's probably one of the most sort of like, I'm just going to say exactly what I think should happen. And then I got on a plane, I left to, <laughs> to England. So I, you know, it was, it, there's a lot of really cool ideas on it. Um, so I read this book, right, which is basically about Gen Z developers and the key topic that I mentioned there was key concepts and ideas, ideas for the next generation of developers. Um, and I kind of picked Gen Z because the book actually started when I was teaching some kids and I put, put a bunch of logos there. And I realized that not only they didn't understood some of them, they didn't understood the history. They didn't understood, for example, Creative Commons and why it's important and, and what, what, you know, what were the battles that originally led to its creation and what does it mean? In the weird ways, like Creative Commons and open source have won the battles, but it's almost like a, there's a whole set of generations that doesn't understand that, doesn't understand what he means, and he does play that game, which is a big problem. So that's one of the things I talk a lot about in the book. And then I kind of came up with this sort of seven, um, uh, oh, sorry, eight um, kind of topics, which sort of summarize the, the thing I want to do, which is you should question everything that happens. You should never take everything for granted. You should make fact-based decisions, and, and, and I'll show you in a bit how now, the approach that I take to graphs and hyperlinking everything allows actually me to, to do that in a much more practical level, where I can actually connect all sorts of information to stakeholders, to managers, to systems, to uh, vulnerabilities, to incidents, to, you know, the whole org chart is, is all hyperlinked, so we can make a huge amount of decisions, and it eventually will reach the code, right? Um, but that's very fundamental. I think it's very important to understand the history of, of how things occur and where we come from, because there's a lot of things that, you know, the evolutions uh, occur, and then you sometimes only see a little shadow of what was there, and then sometimes it's important to understand the things that came behind. Um, this is a big one for me. I think you need to learn how to learn, because I actually feel that, fact, that actually, that's what we should be teaching at school. That's the only thing you should learn, is how to learn. And this is something that I, I've learned later in my career, which is, I realized why I was so effective as a kid in some things and other things I wasn't effective. And then eventually I've learned that you have to learn how to learn, right? It's, it's a very fundamental thing. One of the things I talk about in the book, there's this, there's this great um, example from the, I think the book is called Badass Users. Uh, there's a couple of things it talks about, but one of the things it talks about is this idea that to learn you need two things. You need 
good examples, and you need to see a lot of good examples. Right? And, and it's one thing that we don't do very well. So we sometimes don't have good, we, 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 sorry, two things. The thing is you need to practice right and see good examples, so I understand. So the practice right is very important because it's not about practicing a lot, it's about actually practicing in a particular way that you're learning with massive feedback loops. And then once you have good examples, you're actually learning a lot even without realizing that you're learning. That's why when you see somebody else doing something, you're learning in ways that you don't even understand. So this is very important that you actually know how to be more effective of learning, and you need to recognize when you are in those moments. So I've kind of learned to recognize when I'm in a hyper-learning mode, and then trust that when I'm in not, I eventually will come back to that hyper-learning mode, because you achieve so much more when you're in that place. Now, to understand what the game is playing is also an interesting sort of kind of analogy, which is, do you want to be the person moving the pieces, right? Or kind of playing um, checkers, or do you want to be the one playing chess? Right? Do, you wanna, do you actually want to be thinking in a much more multi dimensional way about what's going on, what's, what matters, what doesn't matter, or are you just in, literally in the weeds and not really understanding what's, what's going on? And when I talk about maps, that comes a lot to it. In, the developing intellectual curiosity is one that I arrived when I kind of was really not happy by, I, I kind of call it the lack of intellectual curiosity. It's like, why don't you go deeper? Right? Like you have a Raspberry Pi, have you blown it up? Have you seen how it works? Have you rebuilt it? Have you actually done other stuff? Like, I think we're creating a generation that is a really good users of technology, but they don't understand what happens. And that means that every time there's a roadblock, they can't go around it. Right? Of course, it's not just for Gen Zs, but I think sometimes we need this kind of intellectual curiosity to go deeper. And the interesting thing about security is you get that on steroids. Because when you do security, I would argue that it's a kind of a professional line that really makes you go deeper because you kind of want to know why and then you'll go why and you kind of go all the way down and you understand and you learn so much more because you actually have to understand how it works, right? And there's nothing like a great way to learn a new language when somebody says, hey, can you do a code review on a Go application next week? We go, yeah, of course, right? Amazon, buy two books on Go, read it, and then you kind of, yeah, I think I can get my head around it, right? But it's very important to, to have on that spiral, right? Look at the hood, the same thing, and, and shake things up, which is actually one of the nicest things about Photobox, is they have a bunch of values, and one of them is shake things up. Right? And I'm like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's me. I can do that really well. But it's important to understand that a lot of the things you do will have a ripple effect. And, and if you worry too much about those ripple effects, you sometimes paralyze. And that, again, is one of the things I talk about. So I view that this is not just for Gen Z, right? I, focused on Gen Z just because it was good to have an audience. And that in my head, I have a, almost like a target audience to, to, to write to. But I would argue that, in fact, like, you know, I don't think there's very few Gen Zs here tonight. But I would say that there, there's this, I kind of view there's two parts here. There's one part, which is the, the pure Gen Z, and it's great when I can reach to them and, and kind of get them new ideas. But I think there's also the existing generations that my, my argument is if you don't behave like this, they will leapfrog you. Right? Because somebody who's playing at this level of thinking will be so much more productive, so much more effective, that actually you know, your value becomes this, and you, you, you start hit to somebody who has that amount of value. I heard this great story of this company who hired a Gen Z, and in the beginning they were really pissed off because you know, the whole thing, oh, it's like they, were, you know, they, were, they said we don't really understand what the guy's doing, you know, it doesn't really you know, come in time and do all these things. And they realized that a month later, that person had reprogrammed some of the business functions because you know, that's how he approached the problem, and now was making them millions, right? Because he didn't do the spreadsheets. So they went to him and says, can you do these spreadsheets? Can you calculate that, that, and that? And that person basically turns around and says, well, it kind of sucks, right? I'm not really going to do that, right? And I'm going to automate my way into this. And now being able to do a lot, a lot more, right? And that's the difference, right? And that's at the basic level. Once you start playing in the cloud properly and you start playing with, with serverless and start playing with that kind of environment, this goes to a complete different level. So. My thing here is how you actually think about these problems, right? So the first part of the book, and by the way, the book is not complete, right? Uh, this is, again, is an interactive DevOps kind of agile style of, of writing a book, right? Because the reality is that if I wanted to write the book in a traditional way, I would have never written it. 
because it would be too much, too much time consuming. I wouldn't have the time. It would feel like a massive jump. It, it would, there would be so many things that could go wrong. There's so many people I had to talk to, so many people I had to ask permission and get kind of buy-in that, and it would be expensive, right, actually, you know, if you try to do it the traditional way, that it wouldn't happen. So this book is actually a variation of um, a bunch of other books that I've already played with, or an evolution of those books, but it's basically me writing in Markdown, pushing it to GitHub, syncing it up to LeanPub, which happens automatically, LeanPub publishes, taking the PDF, putting it into Amazon, and get a book in there. So it's actually not that hard. Right? In fact, one of the things I talk about is you should publish a book. Right? And you should publish a book because the, solving the 10 little problems that are required to publish a book are actually the thing that matters. That's the thing. Right? Is if you can basically move from here's something I, t I find interesting to actually being able to publishing, putting out there, you know, having those self doubt moments, which is actually the reality. Is you look at your problem, you think, is this happening? Is it not happening? Some people have more or less imposter syndrome. You know, I think everybody has a little bit of that. And, but all those steps are super critical. And the thing about this, which is really interesting, is that it's not expensive these days. We live in a world where now there's so much interesting technology and workflows that you can actually do this. So the kind of first main things I talked about here was the kind of what I call the kind of the MVP for the Gen Z, which are all the, I, saw the, I use the, the minimal viable product kind of from, the, from our, our software world, which is the kind of stuff that I feel that if, if you don't understand those worlds and you kind of don't play with those or have any experimenting, there's a whole number of thinking that you're missing. There's a whole number of paradigms that you just haven't been exposed to. And then I talk about technologies like books and pen and paper, which actually are very effective technologies, right? Even today, I did a review in a pen and paper on something that if I had to use Jira, it would have taken me two hours. And in, in literally 10 minutes, using the good old pen and paper, I was able to do it more and more effectively. That's why sometimes people feel, I used to feel guilty for making notes and, and using a notebook, but actually, a notebook, pen and paper is a better technology to capture your ideas than digital. Because actually, even if you never read it again, it doesn't matter. Your brain process is so much better. And there's science behind this, right? Um, and I would argue that a book is a much better technology to read than the digital. Now, if it's a, if it's a kind of um, a novel, where it's like a movie, where you're just you know, almost visualizing in your head, yes, Kindle is fine. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you want to consume information, you want to learn something, a book is a better technology. Your brain processes data better, you index it better. And, and the thing is about, think about this, right? When you read a book and you flick back and forth, think how your brain already knows which part of the page the content is, right? And that's very interesting because it tells you that your brain is absorbing a lot more than you think, right? Think, so are you, I, I have thousands of books in my house, right? I can tell you just about where most of them are, right? And it's weird, right? But actually, it's because your brain absorbs it. Your brain has these things. I think of a book, and I, I, I'm, I can almost remember the ideas on it. I have no idea how many books I bought on Kindle, and I have no memory of the stuff I read. And this is it, because I used to feel guilty about this, and then I realized rationally that actually books are better technology. Right? And books were a technology, you know, and they are, but if you go back 300, 500 years ago, it was a pretty hardcore technology, right, compared to the previous things, right? Um, and then, you know, it goes to like assembly and bytecode, which might feel hard, hardcore, but if you're doing development, you don't know that, you're missing a lot of tricks, right? You, there's a lot of concepts that actually have there. And I think your brain is one of your, a very key technology. You need to understand how it works. Your IDE, which is how you program, is one of the most important things that you need to think about because I'll show you how I approach my IDE. And there's a couple of key paradigms that I feel I use that I think most developers miss a trick. And that means your productivity goes from, you know, 50 to 10, right? If you, you know, this of course is my opinion, but you'll see a couple of things in a second, right? I think machine learning and AI, it's, it's really a big thing now. You know, it's, it's sort of like, although AI is still very debatable, but the whole machine learning, it, it's, it's a massive, right, thing. And, you know, you guys are way heavy into that stuff, right? And it makes a difference. And things like abstract syntax tree, which basically means that you should not think of code as code, you should think of code as graphs. Again, code is already a, a representation of connections, right? And that makes a big difference. Then I'll talk about some life patterns, how you, you need to learn, be a founder, being criticized as a privilege by cap your life. And the talking to yourself digitally is one that I think is very interesting, right? Because 
when, it's for example, like when you do some stuff where you, you're blogging, to, you know, it's, what sometimes you're doing is you're talking to yourself. So I use Twitter as my backup engine, right? I use Twitter as a way to capture things that I find interesting so I can find them later. The fact that somebody else might find it interesting is, it's okay, right? And the fact that I get some feedback, it's, it's cool, but, you know, I, I talk to myself digitally because I leave trails of where my knowledge is, and what I'm helping is I'm helping my brain to index certain locations. So I found myself actually Googling something, giving up, going to Twitter, remember that I actually thought about this before, tracking my, my, my chain of thought and finding the exact link I was looking for. And then what I do is I tweet again with the, the searches, that I, the, almost the items I was referencing to make sure that next time I can find it faster. But this is the same thing that when you're on a Slack channel or whatever you guys use, you just almost paste comments and you're almost talking to yourself, right? Which is, sounds crazy in the beginning, but what you're doing is you're rationalizing your thinking. You are capturing a lot of your ideas. And, and even I found that I go back to what I was saying you know, an hour ago or a day ago or a week ago, and it's really cool to see your evolution. And when you code in a particular way, especially with kind of test room development properly, you are talking to yourself. You are capturing your thinking behind it. Now, you need to think in graphs, right, in terms of nodes and edges, because I think that is a massive change on how most organizations think and how most people behave. And this is really hard, right? I, I, I'm doing a lot of stuff now, and it, the main thing I realize is that it takes quite a long time to really start to think like this. But if there's one thing that will give you a competitive advantage, and the difference between playing chess and playing um, you know, uh, checkers or even not even realize that you're playing a game, is, in my book, is nodes and edges. And that, that's what I mean by a graph, right? So it's not like, you know, a, although a pie chart is still a graph, right, in a way, and, and an Excel spreadsheet is still a graph, it's just, you know, a flat representation, it's nodes and edges, it's, it's connection stuff. So, who know what this is? Anybody recognize this? Okay, so by now you would. <laughs> so, okay, actually the key is there. I just realized I left the name in there, right? Okay, so this is a worldly map, right? And if you take one thing from tonight, right? Apart from the fact they're gonna give you some feedback on the book, right? But if you take one thing, you have to check this out. This is the most interesting thinking and the most interesting I've learned in the last year is this guy who come up with a really great way of thinking, who open sourced a whole lot, who's basically just dumping ideas, right? And saying, well, this is how I think about this. And it's spectacular, right? The way this thing, this solved so many problems that I had that I could have never figured out how to think about stuff. So let me walk you through it. So there's basically, the, the guy is called Simon Worley. He's a really great guy. There's, there's the, the, the kind of book he's writing, which kind of a medium. Just go and read, just read the first three chapters and I'm sure it will click. But let me walk you through it, right? And by the way, this is the first example of the little bot I'll show you in a second. At the moment, I can actually go and render stuff. So this is actually a worldly map created by the bot that I'll show you in a bit. So a worldly map is basically a map that uh, shows you a value chain of things. So say that I need, for example, to sell a cup of tea and I need to sell it to the public and maybe to the business. So I want to create this, right? And to create this, I need a cup, and I need a tea, I need some hot water, so I need water, I need a kettle, and I need some power, right? The interesting thing in business is when you draw normal graphs, right, or normal diagrams, and how many times you got to the board and start drawing little things, right? Most of the times the problem with that is that though you might feel like a map, it's not, because position doesn't matter. And it's very hard to make decisions, right? So the way, the way the kind of the, the sweet spot of this is to think that most things you do start with a genesis, start with an idea. Somebody has like a really like sort of very ad hoc, you know, put together, very sort of immature, but kind of solves the problem. Then with time, it gets better. You kind of build something custom, right? Again, what we develop, we do this a lot. There's a custom build thing, just about works, is repeatable, maybe others can use, but it's still very kind of rough, right? Then what you have is you, people start to productize it. So you can see there's an evolution. Now you can buy it. There's a lot of people that can actually you know, use it. It has documentation. It, it does an evolution. And eventually it becomes a commodity, right? And eventually it's, you, know, you almost don't know you're using it because actually it's just part of you know, 
day life or a part of the stuff you do. What's very interesting about this is that we can then plot on our value chain where was the level of maturity. So this is like a maturity model, right? Is this thing very genesis or is this thing very mature? And then you ask yourself the question, does it make sense that my world today has this particular item at that level? So if you look at this, what we're saying is that I have a, a cup of tea that, which is kind of a product that I'm selling. So for example, if you were a specialized tea house, maybe it was here, right? If you actually were super kind of, you know, some coffee houses today are like here, right? They, they bring custom water from here and they brew the thing and it's all like, you know, our tunas are fine, right? You know, if you go to the sort of Starbucks and, and more modernized, like a coffee machine is almost here, right? It's just commodity, right? Then you got the cup, which we bought, we got the tea, we got the hot water. But what's interesting is you can see the kettle in this case is custom built. And this is actually a really good example because there's a case study of this guy who tried to build a kettle using, you know, without using products, just you know, custom build a kettle. And it was like 10 grand, super, super expensive, barely worked. And it basically was not cost effective, right? Because, you know, all the bits that you need to do for them to build a kettle are actually are the, are the bits. So in this case, if you have this, the question is, why are we building our own kettles? Why are we not buying them, you know, because they are a product? Unless my customers really want to be served by a tea that is built on a freaking custom kettle at this moment in time. Now, you think this is funny, but when you look at your business, you find tons of things that happens like this. So here's a better example. Right? So here's an example where you have, for example, a customer who needs some images, who has a storage, then they need to print. So this is actually, he has to, was to run a photo business, ironically, right? So this is not photo box, but he's like, that's his business. Then you have a website who has a CRM, and you have a platform, which again is a product, and then you have compute, and then you have power, right? So to, to basically to fulfill my customer, I'm going to need my website, I'm going to print stuff, I need a CRM, a, a platform, I need some computing, I need a data center, I need power. Now, what's interesting is when you look at this, and then you say, and, and you think, of what will happen now? Like, does this make sense that I am actually having a data center? Does it make sense that I have my compute? Does it make sense that I have this? So you, you look at the cloud move, for example. What does the cloud move say? Well, I can get my compute from here. In fact, the cloud makes my data center a commodity. Right? So suddenly you realize with, with this, you can map your value chain, and then you think, hold on, does it make sense I'm custom building something that actually there's already a commodity in the market? Or the other way around, does it make sense I'm trying to buy a commodity that actually doesn't exist, and that's why it gets so expensive, where I'm actually might, might treat it as a custom build thing, and then let it evolve at this level. So this makes a massive difference, because this allows you to think in a much more strategic way. And then he evolves this into all sorts of game plans, into all sorts of movements. So this means there's attrition here, for example. And also there's some really cool stuff on actually what's called the pioneers, settlers, and town planners, which is basically the different types of people that you need on different types of, of evolution. So for here, if you're doing the Genesis stuff, you want the pioneers. You want the people that are happy to explore stuff. They are happy with failure. They can think very fast. They don't build so, super solid stuff, but they're the ones who create a lot of innovation. But that is a scale, so then you need the kind of the settlers, which will take that stuff and now try to package it, et cetera. And then once you mature, you kind of need the town planners who are really focused on eff effectiveness, on delivering 99.99% availability. And each of them is important. And, and this is where the other thing I found is that in most teams, we mix all this, which is why you have so much conflict. We mix teams that are developing something that is supposed to be very pioneer, but you put some town planners on it, and they freak out because they just cannot deal with that. On the other hand, if you put some pioneers in some, some guys who are trying to build a system that's supposed to be 99.99 reliable, you don't want creativity here, right? It's like a friend of mine runs a brewery, he says, boring is good, right? Like if you run a production line, Boring, you know, high 99.9 availability is exactly what you want. You're not going to create the new next, you know, innovation from it, but you're going to be able to ship, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of products on time, on delivery, which is what matters. This allows you to do that, which is then when you have things like this, where you can say, okay, why don't I put a team here that does this, and then that team there, and that team here, 
and I want to move this here and then start playing around. So this is basically kind of mapping your world, and this is quite spectacular, right? And I would highly recommend you to think like this and to explore it, because there's, there's a really good amount of thinking on this. And this is a kind of, you know, I, I sort of think about, like, is that a symmetry? Like, when you go against somebody, or when you're working with somebody who thinks like this, they are playing at a different level. Right? So again, my advice to the Gen Z is that they need to get into this kind of thinking because when they hit the marketplace, they add so much value. Not being funny, if, you under, if somebody who understands this is employable today like this, like they will pass all the job interviews because they will basically sit with the interviewer and say, let me just map your business. Right? I just mapped your business and realized that you guys are building custom data centers. You guys are doing this. Like, you, you, do, you haven't realized that your competitors are, are playing this game, right? And if you don't do this, then there goes your market, right? So here, you can identify why Netflix su succeeded. Because if you look at Netflix's game plan, you should see, well, get, Netflix's game plan is to move the streaming there. And then they realized that they had a lot of custom-built products, which was the movies that they were buying, and they couldn't control it. So what they did, they built, they productized the creation of content. They basically said, we're going to build a massive machine to create content, so we're not dependent on those third parties. So they moved there, right? And that's very powerful, because it allows to almost play at a, a very, very interesting level. So here's something I've done with a bunch of kids, which is really cool, right? So the point here is you can say, so the screenshot is not the best, but let's say the same thing. They have the same four levels where you basically have the things that you don't know, the things that I have used it, the thing that I'm good at, and the things that are the expert. What's very interesting about this is that you start talking to them and says, hey, are you passionate? How passionate are you? And some of them will go, I'm very passionate. Some of them, maybe not. But usually you get stuff here. How are green mats? Again, there's an interesting spectrum. But usually some of them will go, yeah, I, I quite like mats. Right? I, I do a lot of mats, right? How are you creatively? Then you think learning skills, organization, teamwork, right? Minecraft, Fortnite, Fortnite kind of over there, right? And, and, my, and then you go, Minecraft, yeah, I'm over here, right? And then you go, you know, Snapchat, how you use Snapchat, yeah, I'm a power user of that stuff. And, and the interesting thing about all this is, if you take Minecraft, for example, Minecraft is about building things. Why was Minecraft successful? It's about Lego, right? It's Lego digitally. So the, the, the kids will spend hours building amazing stuff. So this is the thing, right? So we go, those kids are wasting their time. What the hell are they doing? They're spending all this team in there, right? Meanwhile, you have these kids or these adults, right, who have the mental capacity to build architecturally what they want to do. They spend hours with that attention of detail required to connect all the stuff. They have that craftsmanship ability, which is exactly what we want. So if you look at that, that's what a professional is. A professional is somebody who's able to use a specific set of technique to build something and to connect the dots and to do it actually in sometimes a social environment, right? Then if you look at Fortnite, why is Fortnite so successful? Because Fortnite put three or four things together that made a massive difference. I don't know how much of you guys play Fortnite, you know about it. If you have kids, probably you've heard about the whole thing. But, but think about it. Fortnite has the Minecraft ability because you build stuff, right? Has, in a way, a re very interesting game plan because they force the game to last 20 minutes and they push everything like the, the kind of... Um, Anger games, everybody back to the middle, so you have the fights. Introduce the collaboration. So this is the thing. You say, you know, look at these kids are not doing stuff, but actually you have 20 kids or 10 kids working together, collaborating, all talking strategy, right? That's actually sometimes more collaboration that you see in the business, right? So you learn a lot about that stuff, right? So if you think about it, those are really good skills, right? It's really good strategy. And then you look at things like Instagram, sorry about the spelling mistake, right? So it's interesting, because when I usually do this kind of stuff, I get really good results. Then they go Python, maybe here, Node.js, Linux, et cetera, or languages. Then you get something, maybe I never use it, I don't know, I'm not very good at it. The interesting question here is, what matters? Does, do you want people that are, do a lot of this stuff, or do you want people to do a lot of this thing here? Because for me, this is a lot more important than this. You will learn this. this. In fact, I think we're making a massive mistake with coding and with maths 
because we talk about development, right? We should not talk about developing and learning, you know, loops and all that kind of crap, right? Which doesn't matter. We code to solve problems. It's like saying, I don't know if you read The Mathematician's Lament, which is a, the, the introduction is brilliant, and it talks about this, you know, basically he, he, he totally rips on maths, right? He says that we don't teach maths at schools, which I just about almost agree. He says maths is actually like, almost like is solving problems. It's almost like an art form, right? What we do in school is we reduce it to a bunch of, you know, problems and formulas and kind of things, which, which after a while you don't, don't know what, what's for, right? But the story that he talks about is the idea that imagine that in order to be a musician, the first thing you have to do is to learn all the theory and write beautifully and be able to recognize a fugue from you know, a, a quartet, from whatever, right? Because that's what music is about. How can you ever play music if you cannot actually know all the music theory, right? And the same thing with painting. Imagine that before you even do freehand drawing, you know, that's way advanced, right? You have to first do, know all the colors, know all the, pan, the pantones of that stuff. Now, it sounds ridiculous when you think of music and, and drawing because we treat them as art. But if you look at maths, we do the same thing. 90% of what you know, we learn in maths in school is pointless, right? How many of you use 90% of the stuff you got to learn in maths during school? Most of it is just formulas. It's just you know, stuff, variations. What we should be learning is real formulas, so real solutions, to how to think. We shouldn't tell the kids the Pythagoras theorem. We should give them right, 10 problems that existed that happened to be solved with that and let them come up with solutions. And then one day, when you show them the Pythagoras theorem, they're going, wow, that's beautiful. Because you just did in three little things what I had a formula which is that big and that guy that did and et cetera. The same thing with, <clears throat> with coding, right? Coding is about solving problems. I didn't learn coding because I wanted to learn how to program in X language. I learned coding because I wanted to do a dot on the screen. I want to make it move. I learned trigonometry when I want to make a whole bunch of dots wave in the screen. I've learned more trigonometry in two weeks after we realized that we needed sines and cosines to do that than in a whole year of school, because I never understood what that meant. And suddenly, the moment you have to make something go like this, and multiple speeds and multiple waves, trigonometry makes a lot of sense, right? Because that's what it's for, right? So that's very interesting, because we talk, for example, about the, um, the skills gap, right? So there's all this thing that we don't have enough women in technology, we don't have women in security, we don't have enough diversity. And then there's always this thing that it has to start sooner, we have to get kids excited. And I look at my kids, they're not that excited in technology, right? Now, it doesn't mean that they actually don't have a lot of this. They're just not excited in a very narrow band of the definition of technology that we have today. So what's interesting is that I don't think we have a skills gap, we have a skills transfer gap. So what we need is we need to be much better at taking uh, professionals from one industry and move them to the other, realizing that they already have the best skills that are required in this new industry. So for example, to require somebody to be a computer expert, right, to be a great professional in technology is wrong, because what they need to be really good at is prob solving problems. They need to be good at learning. They need to be really good at understanding how to break down what we need to do in a way that it's a, a executed by a, a computer. So we need a lot more data scientists to come into here. We need a lot more, even poets, right? Even, you know, engineers. Because the interesting thing is the first generation of computer professionals, guess what? They weren't professional. They weren't computer experts at the time, right? But the biggest, some of the biggest evolutions that we had was created. Some of the best ideas and some of the best things we got created in the first in technology, we're creating the first 20 years. In fact, most of the stuff we use was still developed during that period. And the people that developed that were not computer experts because by definition, there weren't any. The people that went to computer were all the engineers, were all the other professionals, were the poets, right? Not being funny, but they bring a huge amount of creativity and, and natural box uh, kind, of, kind of thinking about this. And that's why, that's the people that took us to the moon, right? That's the people that really invented most of computing and that's, what we need. So that's why I believe that diverse teams are so important because you need that intersection between the multiple things. So if you think like this, you know, we have literally millions of engineers, mi millions of doctors, right, of architects, right? I actually think that our industry, especially in software development, we need the architects. We need the engineers to come in because they have a discipline of doing things that we don't. 
Every time I explain how software works to anybody outside the software industry, they freak out, right? Because the things that we do are unheard of on any other industry. And we just happen to run the world now, right? So we just happen to build a whole freaking foundation for the whole world on, techno on processes and technology and workflows that actually if these buildings were built like that, you know, they wouldn't have lasted, right? So I think this is a key interesting example because it shows you that the most important things that you need to do is not a specific set of technologies, it's actually how to get there. Now, on the other hand, you do need to learn technologies. You do need to learn how to code in 10 languages or 20, because every language will give you something different. The key is learning how to learn, and then it becomes easy how to do that. So this is a variation where I said, for example, this is how you take this and create a plan. So you take those technologies that I was saying that are important for you to know. You take Python, Docker, dot .language, um, Creative Commons, Slack and Chekhov's, Google, Jira, OWASP, and and Hugo, right? And you should plot it at, where am I? And now what you can do is you can come up with a roadmap for you. You can say, well, I'm good at Python here, and I need Python to do this. I'm not good at that. And then you can put an hour to say, well, actually, I'm going to move. My plan is to move from here to there. Or you could say, well, that's going to be really hard for me to move, so let me focus on something else. So this is, again, is a great way to strategize and to make rational decisions about how you behave. And you can apply this to anything. Any questions? OK. So I wanted to show this one because, again, this is one of the things I talk about in the book. But it's also one of the interesting sort of topics of, I'm sure you used Visio before, right? I'm sure you've probably seen and play around with it, right, and done diagrams. And, and it's very interesting to think, what is the problem with it, right? Like, why doesn't, why, I would say, why doesn't hyperlinked data in a graphical way scale? And, and this is that kind of step, so that if you think about it, right, if you have a visual diagram, first of all, it's a, not an accurate representation of reality, right? That is your interpretation of what you actually think is happening. And it's very hard to update, right? Because once you make changes, after a while, it becomes really hard. And it's not used by everybody. So this is the first thing. So here you're creating a visualization that is not going to be used by everybody every day. So guess what will happen, right? It will be out of date very quickly, right? And once it becomes out of date, nobody's going to use that thing. Right? They, they're not maps, and by maps I mean that the position doesn't matter. So in a visual diagram, if you move this guy from here to there, a lot of times it doesn't make a difference. Right? And that should make a difference because the map, the positioning of things, the movement is actually one of the most interesting things you can get. Right? Then you mix data and design usually in the same file. Right? And this is where it, sometimes it's interesting because technology is not the solution all the time, but technology enables a lot of good solutions. So the fact that, for example, Visio and a lot of the other, even the online ones, they mix code and data, well, that's a deadly sin, because now you can't really understand it. And then if you store it on, on binary XML format, you can't diff the thing, so it's pointless, right? And then you mix abstraction layers, they don't create from dynamic data, and even the design is pixel-based, it's very time-consuming, it usually becomes a work of art. Right? But the problem with this is that the point of documenting something in Visio is to help everybody to be on the same page and is to help um, to have a representation of reality. So that's why you want to start thinking about programmatically generating this. And so this is created using, for example, plan to ml So this is actually a text-based um, kind of description that then you, you generate an image from it. So I'll show you some of the stuff that we're now doing on top of this, which is really, really cool. But it's very important that you start to, for example, create your diagrams in text-based environments because it means you can version control it, you can put it on GitHub, it's easy to diff, it's easy to share, it's easy to update. More importantly, it's easy to automate because all you have to do now is write something that writes that text and then you get the graphs for free. Right? So let me show you a demo of uh, some of this stuff going in action. Now, so first of all, here's my... IDE for now. And um, by the way, how many, just guess this, how many of you guys code or do development on kind of cool, all right? Um, so, so I have not actually, I, I've done a lot of stuff in C Sharp, although I've done a huge amount of stuff in .NET actually. And these days I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff in Python. Just, and I'm doing a lot of stuff in, 
in AWS. But, that, but all this can apply to Azure, and I, and I have to say, I think Microsoft, since we're here, right, have massively turned the corner. And I think, you know, before the new guy, right, literally they're going down the drain, right? Like you could see, you could see the problems, right? You know, uh, and I think it, credit to Microsoft, right? I think now they really, you know, are pointing in a way, way much better health, you know. And, and when, when Microsoft buys GitHub and says, oh yeah, you know, even when Microsoft buys, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and I think, yeah. And to be honest, right, I, I, I find that these days, you know, like for example, like what, I, I'm gonna show some Lambda stuff to you guys, but I actually think that Microsoft is doing some really cool innovation on there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think there's a huge amount of great innovation. In fact, I'm gonna show that a lot of this stuff is open source. I would actually love to see the, 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 the cloud part of this replicated in other clouds. It just happens to now that we use AWS across the board, so, you know, for me and now, you know, um, I'm using AWS all the time, right? But, uh, but, but I, I don't view that as a key element. It's almost, a lot of these things is actually the thinking that matters, right? I could rebuild all this stuff from scratch because the, the interesting part is the, the thinking, that's what takes time, is to get your head around how that thing behaves, right? So the first thing that I feel that is very important is that, and, and this is kind of like one of the things I talk about the book, it's called a REPL, right? So a REPL is basically, uh, can I make this bigger? Cool. Is a read, write, uh, execute loop, right? And, and what, what it means is, is basically an environment when, um, that when you make a code change, right, what happens is you lift your hands and the code runs. So in my book, if you're ever programming, if you're doing anything in automation and you know an environment where you make a code change and you lift your hands, right? Or you have a key, a special key that you can just do it without thinking. So I also have uh, command enter done on it. So if you know an environment where you can get sub-second execution of what you've just done, or second execution, you're missing a trick. That means that whatever you're doing, your productivity is literally reduced by orders of magnitude. And these days, I would argue that there's very few things that you can't achieve this. It's just a question of refactoring. It's just a question of looking at exactly what's causing the problem, looking and, and literally cleaning it up, cleaning it up, clean it up until you can hit the right point, which is why you need test driven development on steroids to achieve this kind of stuff. So in this case, what you have is you have a web page on the right. Now, I'm basically making a code change here, and I just got it so that IntelliJ, um, when it actually makes a change, it triggers the test who actually runs and updates the page. What is actually happening here is that is actually running Chrome, uh, Chromium. I'm using Puppeter, which is a really great, you should definitely check it out. Puppeter, which is a browser automation framework for Chrome. They basically automated the Chrome um, debug kind of um, environment. So you communicate is the Chrome debugger. And it's really cool because I can now control Chrome from here. And actually, if you use JavaScript, you have to check Wallaby.js, which I think I have a chapter on it, which is freaking brilliant. It's even better than this. But unfortunately, it doesn't exist for Python, so this is the second best thing. But Wallaby.js is even this better. So this is a very simple example, right? Now, what I can do, and okay, this is not very exciting, right? But just to, again, just to show you that I'm actually, you know, manipulating stuff. Let me just add this little bit to the top, which basically means that I'm actually running, and this is where it gets, gets more interesting. So this basic is going to go there, write a script, and then you can see it shows up, right? Now, one of the things I can do here is I'm actually also taking uh, a screenshot of this, right? So the other thing I'm doing here, and this is the, the power, right? So, so if you think about it, if I do my worldly map, right, what Chrome gave me was the ability to now as a commodity, the fact that I now run in Chrome, I get for free screenshots, right, of the page that I'm running, right? This is the kind of stuff that I remember spending <laughs> months, right, building variations of this so that just get that automation and now I get that for free. I get the ability to say, as soon as I run this, the simple command in Chrome say, give me a screenshot. And that's the kind of thinking that suddenly makes a massive difference. So you can see that this is a screenshot, which actually is clipped, so because again, Chrome has the ability to say what is the, ta, 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 let me go and move to the right. So Chrome has the ability to actually define this. So I can come in here to my example 
And I can say, hey, you know, actually, let me make this bigger so you can see it. So this is just an example. So, so here you got my clip, which is, so this is the code I'm running, right? Run this, run the test one, two, three. This actually just happens to run, loads that page, which is this one here, see? So, the, so, I, I, so this is the method, open file and take screenshot. Again, you refactor until it's just exactly what you want to say. And then I can define the, for example, the clip size. So if I change that to 150, run it, you get to see that uh, my screenshot just got bigger, right? So, so now I think about what I just have. So I now have the ability to run something on a web page, load it something there. Maybe you want something a bit more interesting. So now you want some bootstrap stuff, right? And then that basically, you know, now builds the whole thing now with Bootstrap, right? So now I have the ability to put up all, all the kind of stuff in, that you got there, take, take a screenshot and save it. Now the interesting thing about this is, okay, this is now running, oh, I think I need power. This is now running on, on my box, right? Which is not very interesting. One of the things I've done here was I've, so first of all, you guys use Lambda functions or, 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 or what's called web functions, right? All right, so if I asked you, to run that on, uh, on the cloud, on Azure or AWS. How long will it take you to do that and how long will it take to execute? Go on, you guys are developers. Is what? They are containers, but they're more than that. Well, let's talk about that, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not just containers, right? Lambda is a completely different way of approaching how you develop. Lambda is abstracting the execution of your code to a just-in-time function base uh, priced by function, price by execution environment, which is very different. So you can spin up a container. Yes, of course, you can spin up a container. But, you, but to, to simulate Lambda, you need to be able to spin up a container in half a second, load the data in there, find the code, load the code, execute it, get the answer, and stop the container again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you, you can. The, the difference of this is scale. So can you, can you find the, the power strip? Yeah. So the difference is scale, right? So I'll show you something in a second, but we, we, where I think will make a big difference, right? So OK, go on. You guys, you guys done Azure developments. Or, OK, how long will it take you to deploy that, right? OK, let me, let me explain what that is, right? What, what I want to do is I think my need an extension. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, move it back, yeah. So, so, so what, what you want to do is you want to basically fire up a serverless function, right? You want to start a web server on the serverless function, right? You want to open up Chrome in the serverless function, right? You want to open the page, a page from your web server in the serverless function, take a screenshot, send it down, right? Can you guys see the power of that? If you do that, that means that any file that you can render locally, you can basically render programmatically in a way that after a while you stop caring, right? Because if you can do that, it means that you can now say, I can pass a parameter there and say, hey, can you render me this? Can you render me this page? Can you render me this diagram? Can you render me this? And anything that you can do in a web page, you can now do on your, your Lambda function, right? So how long will it take? you to fire that up, assuming that you have all the technical bits. Assuming, let, let, me get, let me tell you that it's easy, right? It's basically, from a technical point of view, you have a command to start u.net or Java or u.net. So let's say you have, a, you have a, a command that says start Cassini or whatever, web server.exe, right? You have another one which is start puppeter, right? And you have another command which is allows us to open the thing and then another command to give you the screenshot and then another command to just return it, right? So I'll give you all that for free, right? So what, how would you then approach the other bits? So you need to go from code running on my box to code running in Azure, right, if you are in that world, and then I get the feedback back. But you've got the tools, though. Yeah, yeah, you've got the tools. And they're working. 
Cool. And how long will the execution take? Cool, that's fast. So, so in, in, in less than how many seconds? Yeah. Well, this, so, so I'm about to show that working, right? <laughs> so don't worry. That actually works, right? So um, did you run out? Did you? OK, cool. Um, yeah, I'm about to show it working, right? So OK, let me take a step back. How long does it take you to run an Azure function like an, or an AWS function? So when you run the Lambda function from your machine to the thing, how long does it take? Sorry? So how do how you do it? Yeah. Um, so there's either an empty or local bin, you just push it over there and it just runs. Cool. And how long does that process take? Uh, fun. Yeah. So I'm talking about making a code change on your computer, right? And from that, so I want to make a code change. So I want to have the same environment that I have here, but through Lambda, through the, through the cloud, right? <laughs> Assume that VZ2 doesn't crash. <laughs> All right. So you're on 30 seconds, right? But, and that's, you know, that's not, so by, with 30 seconds, what you do is you take your code, right? You, you, what, you guys use some kind of cloud formation, some kind of automated build thing, or you upload to an FTP or, or, or. So it depends on like, you're going to go through the CRCD. Yeah. So yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's the fastest you can do that one? So, I mean, it's literally cutting an up and enter on a CLI terminal. Cool. And that's? Yeah, 30 seconds to get up. Cool. Right. So let me show an example, right? So I'm going to show you first, before actually maybe I show you this, let me show you the, the a Hello World one, right? So, so I have here, so this is, this is the example, right? So you can see here, I got my... Hello world there, and I got my test. And by the way, like so, the way I, the way I look at this, right, and just from a, a very quick contest in development, which I don't have time to get into, you have to make sure that everything you do is actually um, tested, right, and everything uh, you you do is done through tests. So the key thing here is that never use a main and never use uh, something that doesn't allow you to codify. Your test. So I use tests for everything I do, which actually means that I always leave this massive breadcrumb of all the stuff that I do, right? And that again speeds up your development tremendously. So all you have at the top is my simple, you know, uh, function at uh, AD1, and here I have a method called lambdas. It's going to push this guy. I'm going to send a payload in this case world, and then he's going to invoke that particular function, right? So, so what you have here is basically. Uh, that example, and this is just the first one. So I'm going to basically run this test, and this should, if all goes well, run in about 1.6 seconds. Right? So let me just automate this so you can see it working. So I'm now going to go to go something like this. Oh, actually, I have an assert, so you can't see the result. Right? Actually, the test should fail, right? Because there you go. See my, te see my test fail there? If you don't notice, right? So my test is now showing that. My result is not hello world, it's hello there. Right? And, and basically, so let me just now print this out so you get to see here. And then um, what you actually have here is an environment that uh, what I have is oh, every, every time I make a code change, you see that the, the result comes back, right? So can you see the hello world there? So if I go hello London. And again, the same thing, I lift my hands, and that just executed. So to be clear, what's happening in the second is I'm taking a zip of the source code, I'm uploading to an S3 bucket, I'm going to AWS, I'm saying how the, the Lambda function code has changed, I'm invoking the Lambda function, I'm getting the result. Now, I did this because when I started doing Lambda functions, right, it took 30 seconds. And I'm like, I can't code like this. Like, I, I just simply cannot code in an environment where it takes me more than 10 seconds to get feedback because my brain 
doesn't work, right? Like you lose track, you, you lose all your mental models. That means that every code change that I do, I have a 10 second gap, right? Like that means that if I wanna make, it takes me a minute to make 10 changes, right? And this also means that because now I have this level of, um, what's it called? Um, is this, sorry, is it working? Sure this. Uh, 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 uh. Hmm. Can you, sorry, just making sure that I got power or else uh, this the, the the best part of the demo is not gonna work. Can you just double check? Yeah. So so this makes a massive difference, right? So what, what the, this is the kind of, so the key concept of the then going back to the kind of the Gen Z way of approaching things. It's about looking at problems and refactor every little problem one by one. It's literally about marginal gains. The reason it takes 1.5 seconds is because I automated, or I looked at every little bit that was required and tried to understand where's the bottleneck? Why is the complexity? And then eventually you realize that the complexity is just some, some gigantic over-engineering here Right? And, and then you realize, I don't need that. So what's powerful about this environment is I can now code locally using the cloud environment. So I don't need a cloud simulator. Right? I run my stuff directly in the cloud. And that means that now it's quite even powerful because suddenly the speeds, you're now working in an environment where you have network speeds between your data files of literally you know, gigabytes, right? Suddenly moving, consuming hundreds of megabytes of data doesn't become a problem because I don't have to bring them locally. I just consume them there. If I need to spin up a lot of stuff, I just you know, work, work on them at that level. And that makes you know, a massive difference. Now, maybe before this whole thing, I ran out of battery, I'll show you the other example. So in this particular case here, I'm now gonna run my lambda function, so what you see here is I'm going to run my lambda function in the actual, um, so I'm going to actually run this, and I'm actually going to render this particular file, and I'm going to do the same thing, browse, update with, with source, and invoke it directly there. And, and what that means, is that means that uh, I'm now going to basically run the similar kind of thing, but... Um, directly, and where's my screenshot, right? Um, directly on, uh, on, on Lambda, and then I get my, my, my image. So that image that you see there, right? So that actually takes five seconds, but that five seconds I think is because the first execution, it actually needs to load the whole thing. So the usually is about three seconds. So, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, yeah, I have, Ten of examples that I can show you, right? So, da, da, da. so now it depends if I want to do it um, with or or without the. Um, just give me a second. Under PNG file, cool. Move right so you get to see it, and so. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna run it, in fact. So this actually is not gonna run locally, it's gonna run there, right? And I'm gonna open that file so you get to see it. In fact, so, so this actually might be, so those two seconds might be the local network, right? So that's, that's uploading the code. If I don't want to upload the code, I don't want to update the code, I just wanna render it, because it's already there. This will take, uh, you know, even less. Right, because it's literally um, just uh, updating it. So it's just running it. So you can see it got to three, three point seconds. So that, that three seconds is literally the time that it takes to start a local web server, start Chrome, open the page in Chrome, take a screenshot, bring it back, right? But what, what, what I can't sort of, sort of underestimate this, right, is the speed that you get once you program like this. Right, the effectiveness that you have when, when you can kind of have this sort of super feedback loops. So I now have a feedback loop with the cloud, right? I can spin up instances. I can connect to all sorts of the things that the cloud has in this kind of environment. And because I'm sub five seconds, six seconds, I'm coding in this flow, which you just get, right? But let, let me, you know, let, let's make sure that you guys. Sorry? 
So, um, yes. So, put it this way, right? Actually, there's a project that I worked on that, um, what's it called? Uh, where it's actually a .NET project, which actually, I think they're about to open source it, which is really cool, where I did exactly that, right? So, what I, what I did when I was using IS is actually, I wasn't using IS, I was using Cassini, right? And, um, and basically, so that should have changed it. Uh, so, so what do you do with, I, with IS? You use something like Cassini, or the, actually the built-in web server, and, and basically, you start it. No, no, Cassini is the .NET first. So if you want to run a .NET application, in fact, depends if you run the new one, because the new one actually runs that in memory, right? So actually, it's much more effective. So the point here is that what you do is you start that in memory. So actually, I remember in using ncrunch. By the way, if you guys are using .NET, you have to use ncrunch. Right, we can end crunch rocks, right? Because it gives that. So I remember writing end crunch functions that would last about a second that would do exactly that. That would fire up, I think it was a, a refactored version because I found the best place to start Cassini at the time. So we actually start a full web server. So I didn't have to worry about the crazy mock stuff that, that .NET had. I was actually running a full blown version of the web server, right? And then I would actually load the page and I could write tests that would actually go behind the scenes, populate objects, go back, open pages, and actually go and write my test to make sure that this page actually checked the stuff correctly. And, and that code is all about, available if you guys want. And that was really cool. It's the same approach. I'm like, hey, I want to open a web page, and I want to see if I open this web page, what happens on my back end? What happens on my memory, right? So it's the same thing. You, gotta, you load it up, right? And this is why coming from a security side is very interesting, because you can always do stuff in security, right? It just depends on how low you go on the, on the stack, right? So when somebody says you can't do this, you go, well, you can. You just have to you know, realize, do you, are you using an API that was being publicly shared, or you just go around the corners, right? So, so basically, so, but I'll, see, but this, this still sucks, right, to be honest, right? No, it's great for development, right? But it's not how you consume it. The way you consume it is like this, right? So, for, so what we then do is we build these cool Slack bots. So I don't know how many of you guys are into Slack, right, and Slack bots. Who uses Slack? All right, so you guys have to get into this stuff, right, girls, right? Because this is really cool, right? So basically, what, what, what we now build, so this is the stuff that we build uh, you know, at Photobox, group security. So we build this to automate security, right? And I'll show you some examples. So, but the concept of behind this, right, is, oh, there we go. Oh, actually, I'm already talking to the bot, so I just go low. The point of this is, is the same thing. It's finding a problem and, and refactor, refactor, refactor until the, the thing becomes simple, right? So what, what you see here is, you know when I was actually updating that function there with a the, with the test, I was actually updating uh, this version here, where I actually can see the list of files that are available. So you can see that, see that test one, two, three, right? That's the one that we were editing just now, right? So I can now run my serverless from here, because I can go browser, render, and I can render that thing here. So what you see here, right, is the same execution that I run locally but now in the browser. So if I go back here, right, and I change this one to say, now let's see you in, uh, right, environment, what you now have here is, so I need to run the command I'm running is this one here, which basically says, can you run this and update the, update the Lambda function, right? So if I now update the Lambda function, which I actually think this guy will do it, right? Because I believe this runs, yeah, the, the file. I'll just double check, does it that one too? I should be able to have, right, the, the new version already pushed to, to here, right? There you go, right? So, this is crazy powerful because it means that we can add features at the speed and have an interface. So we now use Slack bot, the Slack to talk to this. This is the difference between containers, right, and, and, um, and serverless. That thing cost me 0 0.01 cents to run, right? And what happens here is that when I send a command to Slack, that opens up a Lambda function 
that actually calls another lambda function because the first one is just a routing function, who calls, who now going to spin this up, who's going to open up Chrome, who's going to open the stuff, going to get the screenshot, but actually the result is actually sent to another lambda function who actually talks to Slack and sends it over. So what we now have is this ability to really segment all the key dependencies into very laser sharp focus. So it's like microservice on steroids, right? Which is really what it's supposed to be about. So, uh, so basically, I have a, la a serverless environment that is, that is issue on demand that has the capability to do stuff like this. But it gets a bit better, right? Because what I can also do, and so we use Jira as a graph database. And one of the things I can do here is I can say to our kind of Slack bot, can you go to Elk? So we take all our data from Jira, we pump it to Elasticsearch, right? That happens kind of in real time. Then we say, hey, can you go to Elk? And can you download this data in here and show me all my Jira tickets? So this is one ticket that is connected to a whole pile of other tickets. So this basically says, here's a project in this case, and this project is fixing a bunch of vulnerabilities and has a bunch of stakeholders. But I can say, actually, can you plot me, instead of going up one node, can you go up two nodes? Or can you go up three nodes? Or can you go up four nodes? See, the, at this moment, what actually happens is the whole graph creation, the whole lambdas became invisible, became a commodity. Now, we interact with Jira and come and see, and see the side effects here. And that's that kind of thinking where you're always you know, doing that REPL, the, the read, execute, you know, loop, print. You know, I make a change and I see it and you kind of keep looping and looping and looping. So you can see here that you can you see the graph changing. And what, what you have here is a graph that now shows you a particular issue, or the project has a particular set of issues, and these are actually the, our, our top level risks, and this is actually our aggregation, but we also have our stakeholders. So this might look a, a very complicated graph, but it's actually crazy simple, because that graph answers the question from this project, why are we doing it, the vulnerabilities, what are the risks that we're addressing, who's supposed to be informed, which is the stakeholders. And every one of those becomes a node on that particular uh, environment. But then what I can do is I can say, actually, why don't you take this and, and show this information, for example, in a table? So now I can go to my browser. And actually, by the way, just so you can see a variation of this. So I can say screenshot, uh, sorry. Uh, let if I spell this correctly. Uh, and then, so this is, this is kind of, this was my first MVP on this, right? I says, hey, can I take a screenshot from a Lambda function, right? And then once I can do that, Kenny goes to uh, better websites, right? So, so that was, that's a serverless function going to the web, taking a screenshot, and sending the result back to Slack. But of course, oh, oh it helps if I actually do it correctly. Um, I think it's use WBC, okay, okay. And, um, but of course, that that, oh yeah, there you go, BCC, cool. Well, ah. <laughs> there you go, right? But what I want to do in this case is I want to use my, my, my more, more interesting, uh, actually before that, let me show you this one, uh, table. See, there, there's this. And actually, that's because I chose not to shoot the full page. You, there's one setting to go full page, which is really cool. So now, we start to consume the data, for example, from that graph from, from Slack. So actually, I, w I would argue that I want every tool that I use to give me this stuff, because this is a much better way to consume information. So this is actually the table created by the data from that particular graph, right? And in this case, there was not a lot of data on it, but if I pick one that has uh, a bit of information, let's say this guy here, uh, you can then, uh, where are we? Actually, I don't know what happened. I just picked the graph. And then... Uh, excuse me, are you calling the virtualization from the Windows pen but the virtualization from Linux? Because it's not much of a difference. Well, you can do the same thing in Windows, right? It's just a question of how fast it runs, right? So this, this, this is the thing, right? Like the, the thing about containers that would make a big difference right, was that suddenly you can spin up a Linux instance or, or a Windows, uh, I think you can spin up core now, right? In, in sub-second, right? So once you can spin up that in sub-second, the whole game changes. 
So you don't have to actually um, you know, spin up all things, you know, massive environments, because it just it starts in, in, in sub-second, because it's actually a process. A container is basically just a process that has been isolated. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. Like the, 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 the container technology, well, it doesn't, because the container technology it creates an environment where you're completely isolated. Well, to a certain degree, right? But, and, and after it matters, like, it's an interesting example. Like, even if you pop out of the container, it still happens to be in a VM running the container, right? So, again, there's, there's certain levels of security. See, so now the, here's a pay, a table with the data from that graph, right? Now, the reason that, for example, this is, this is powerful is because what you actually have is, and let me show you uh, something like this. What was it? Um, by, uh, I think it's that one. So, so that table, now you get to see. So that table is, I took a graph that we created that has, let's say, you know, lots of nodes and edges. I say to my Lambda function, right, that now renders a bootstrap table of that graph data, which suddenly become completely consumable, right? Now, um, what you have here is, uh, no, sorry, browser graph. So you have here is now a variation of that when I'm using VJS. How many of you guys use VJS, if you know? VJS is a brilliant JavaScript library. So the first thing is at the top, we're actually using plan to ml. This, uh, and it helps. Okay, so the reason there's only one dot is because I, I said I only gave one Jira issue. I kind of need to give it a graph, right? It helps if you're actually plotting a graph. So let me pick one of the graphs I created here. So if I now pick this big graph that have 73 nodes, and this could scale to quite a lot. So what's really cool about this is now anything that you can render with, um, what's it called? With, with a browser, I can render like this, and I can consume it in serverless, and I can develop it in a feedback loop of seconds. So now my, my kind of argument is that if you now have people in your organization that can do stuff like this, the rate of development and the rate of innovation is really off the charts. So what you now have here is a, a visualization of a particular issue that shows the top level risks. That, this is our top level risk, this is the second one, these are the vulnerabilities, those are the, the, the things that we haven't addressed. So, so now that becomes a visual representation of that uh, the graph that I showed you. So this is actually a representation of, of that one, which is this one here. And we're still playing around with this. But you see that the, the, the point I want to make here is that is this feedback loop, right, that we have that becomes a massive difference. And just final little feature, which is pretty cool, is I can also, uh, and this is the moment where we now also start to integrate this with the business, is I can also go like this. And what this is going to do, this is going to create a Google Slides PowerPoint, right, of the data in the graph with some of the graphs. So this is the moment, and again, when you do the Google PowerPoint, what you get, what you, get you get the PDF of that of Google Slides. So we now have the ability to take the data in the Jira environment, which is basically a graph database, which is quite a nice one, pump it into an elastic search, and then visualize it into graphs so we make sure it's connected correctly, and then pump it in something that actually the business can understand. So this is running again on a serverless function, right? And the delay here is actually Google. That is, takes a bunch of time once you use the APIs, then the serverless function. So this is just called a serverless function that now grab the data from, first of all, calculated the graph, which I was just showing you above, and then um, allows me to come in here and see the, the graph for this particular project. So this is, happens to be one of the projects we have, which is cybersecurity inductions. I can see the description. I can see the services users. And I can then see the graphs is addressing. So this is now a deck that we go to the stakeholders and saying, here it is. And then when they say, what about this? What about that? We go and make the change in Jira, which is a nice place to edit it. Press the thing again. And there, there you go. But this is that feedback loop, right? All of this is just looking at all the little bits and saying, how can we just improve and make it easy to consume? So that's my point where when you think on the kind of stuff I talk about from a Gen Z environment, right? This is how you need to behave. Because this gives you a speed, right? That if you don't, if you imagine when you compete against this kind of speed, 
right? You know, th th think about it, right? And this is interesting, because when I, when I went to my team a couple of months ago and said, we need to create a PowerPoint for every stakeholder that we have, right? I would need to create like 50 or 100 PowerPoints. It was, I almost had a riot in my hand, right? Because they were like, there's no way we're going to create that. The reality, I should have said, we're going to create 500 PowerPoints, right? Because we are creating PowerPoints per stakeholder, per project, per uh, function, per business, per business entity, because it's as simple as this. Right? Now, the hard part is getting the workflow. The hard, the hard part is actually getting the thinking. It's to thinking in graphs. Technology helps, but it's that workflow that we need to kind of get along. So, yes, yeah, so I highly, and by the way, this is all open source. All the kind of bits to, to do this stuff are they all open source in the project on called serverless render or something like that. And so, we great to, I would love to get to, to do this in other clouds because I actually think that really cool to figure out, for example, can we render this better in Azure? Can we render this, for example, Google Cloud probably might be a better one to render the, the Google Slide stuff, right? But I think it would be really interesting to be able to compare and say, hey, now I got a, a, you know, the, the bits run in multiple uh, clouds, let's actually run a benchmark, right? And I actually think that some of the stuff that Azure is doing with Google Functions is actually really, really interesting, right? Which I, I think it would be a, a great way to actually um, sort of play with. So before I kind of, for this, any kind of questions on, on that stuff I was showing you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing is always to look where the bottleneck went, right? So, so one, for them, one of the things we did recently was we were consuming uh, cloud trail logs, right, or you know, a massive pile of logs, right? So. So what we built was we built a worker, a little worker function, right? That you can give it 100 logs, right? Or 200 logs, and it basically take the thing, loads the logs, unzip it, does the JSON, does some massaging, sends it to Elasticsearch, right? The problem with this stuff is always like, how do you scale? The coolest thing on the, the functions, right, in a cloud environment is, is I can start them asynchronously, right? So I can start 200 sessions in parallel. So I can basically create 300 PowerPoint slides in parallel because I can start, once I can create one, I can create 300. Now the interesting question is now, where, where's my bottleneck? Is my bottleneck going to be Elasticsearch or my bottleneck is going to be you know, other places? But I, I think the, 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 the interesting thing is, is, is to see, is to make sure that you use the best technology for what it is. So we use Jira to store data. Like Jira is not good to visualize, it's not good to query, it's not good to, to for example, we, we look at relationships. So we, what we do is we, you have an incident, on an incident we, we create a bunch of tasks. From the tasks we discover vulnerabilities, for example, that cause the incident. Then the vulnerabilities are connected to the risk. The risk is actually connected to the parent risk and the top level risk and the top level risk, right? But actually this vulnerability belongs to an IT system who belo who's a parent of a child of that IT system who actually has a business owner of her that is a technical owner. He is basically the, the technical owner here. Now, once this is hyperlink, you need to navigate this, right? So the thing is that we use Jira to store the relationships. So we use Neo4j, but it was actually, that was not the bottleneck. So then we actually said, let's pump this into a, a hash-based database, like Elasticsearch, which indexes everything, and then we consume that from the Lambda functions, right? So what, we actually write the graphs in the Lambda functions, because, the, and then sometimes we use uh, Network X, which is like a, a kind of a, a graph uh, engine. So for example, if I want to calculate uh, risk paths, I can then build a graph and then say, give me the shortest path, give me all sorts of things. But it's about finding where's your bottleneck. Right? And, and the thing about the cloud, which is really interesting, is that you can scale up right, quite effectively. And then, look, I, I actually had this case where I was actually simulating the cloud with EC2. Right? So there's nothing wrong. Right? So I, I, when we're doing this thing where we had to process like, literally lots and lots of data where actually the Lambda weren't powerful enough, but what we did was we basically used programmatically, we would create a 64 core, you know, I think it had like 64 cores with, I think it was actually 120 gigabytes of, no, 256 gigabytes of memory, one of those. That actually started in about four seconds because it's such a powerful machine. We would then, you know, SSH into it programmatically. We would then down, clone a repo, then trigger the code, do all the analysis, and then copy the result into an S3 bucket and close it, right? And that will last like, you know, three minutes. 
and now we'll process a, a lot of data, right, at that process. So we actually were using, and another one will take like half an hour and then shut it down. And then you look at it that actually I'm using a, a, a machine that costs almost 50 grand a year to run, but it's costing me five quid or two, two quid per execution. Right? And that, so that's actually, in a way, you, you can, that's kind of serverless, right? If, if any, from the, code, the point of view of the code, right, I build that. But I found that most of the stuff that we do, you don't need that. Because I, what I found these days is that if you have scalability problems, you're asking the wrong question. You have too much data. There's very few cases I've seen that if you do a series of data reduction, you actually um, you know, have a much more optimized kind of environment. And the idea is that your whole thing should be like you know, the whole cows versus puppies kind of thing, right? You don't want puppies, you don't want stuff you maintain. You want entire discardable infrastructure. So you should be able to rebuild everything, right? Your even your data sets. And that's why you don't want data sets of gigabytes or terabytes, right? Because they're hard to build, they take time. And most of the time you don't need that amount of data. Because if you think about what you want, you get you cut, 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 and then you arrive at very clean data sets. And then it's fine. If you realize I need something else, you go back two steps, you add the code, rebuild the whole thing again, and you're back there. And that, for me, is how you scale. So that, and what's interesting is then you say, OK, now I'm coding on top of Elasticsearch, which is actually a hell of an engine. So suddenly, I can send a file to Elasticsearch, or you know, 10 files, or 100 files, or 10,000 files, or 20,000 files, and Elasticsearch would index it in seconds. Right? So suddenly, imagine you, you're coding in this environment that you have, you, so you have serverless that gives you super execution. You have Elasticsearch that now gives you all sorts of, uh, of, of database you know, power, and, and it's super, and super quick. In this case, Elasticsearch is not serverless, but it's almost in this particular case. But you can use things like DynamoDB and others, right? Or you can use S3. So the other one to use is you can actually use S3 as a data store. Because in the cloud, the speeds are insane, right? So it was actually interesting that we did tests, and, and literally, it was crazy fast to load stuff. You actually didn't realize it was actually better to encrypt everything, sorry, zip everything, because it's faster to load stuff zipped, especially in text-based stuff. And it's faster to unzip it than the actual network cost. But the comparison between loading from anything else but from within the cloud environment is, is ridiculous, right? And then think about it, in that environment, I'm coding locally, but the, the commands are actually executed in the cloud environment. So suddenly everything, again, doesn't take a lot of time because I'm downloading megabytes or 100 megabytes in, in one go, but I'm not doing from here. I'm actually doing it from cloud to cloud. So cool. Um, on the Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because I actually don't know a lot how the Azure stuff works, right? What I know these days is that both Microsoft, Google, and, and AWS have the best security teams in the world, right? And, and what they do, which is kind of cheeky, but it's okay, is they, they have the shared model responsibility, right? So they say that we give you X. We'll give you infrastructure, we'll give you network security, we'll give you the server installation, and we'll give you the, the keys of the castle for you to get in. What you do when you get there, it's your story. So I'm telling you from a security point of view, these days, you know, I would say a local security team versus the teams in, in these companies, you will lose every time, right? So if you make mistakes, if that's, I don't know if that's a mistake, I, I don't know, the, I, I haven't done with Azure and .NET in a while, and, and the AD, but if that happens there, most likely it would also happen locally, right? You need a hell of a team locally to get to the point where you're better than those guys. 
it can happen. Some, some people have it. But by then, you, you know, you're rebuilding some of those things. And then it's fine. You know, you, you know, it's your competitive advantage, right? But I would say these days, the cloud, the speed that it gives you and the effectiveness that it gives you is, you know, the economics and, uh, and the, the workflow is just completely different. Right? So, yeah, so, so if you shoot yourself full in the cloud, yes, but you shoot yourself full also locally. The cloud actually allows you, if anything, allows you to play a game that you couldn't do locally, which is to create a lot more isolation because it becomes cheaper. So I would argue these days, you don't actually, for example, try to protect everything. You create lots of isolated environments, actually use what you know, we called um, the whole, um, what's it called? Beyond, Google talks about beyond, um, beyond networks, kind of, be, sort of the, whole, the whole idea that uh, beyond security, where you basically, you don't trust anything, and every stuff is basically using these, these individual kind of components, where it depends where you come from, you get given the privileges that you're actually connecting to. So actually beyond corp, sorry, that's, that's what they said, not beyond security, beyond corp. But, but that, what's one of the cool things again on that environment is you can create lots of isolated stuff. Right? And then just have some kind of single sign-on or some kind of connection between the dots, which, which makes a big difference. Driving change is really difficult, right? But sometimes it works, right? or sometimes the pain point of moving, it feels quite, quite high. So the thing that's interesting of what we're doing now is we, we now are starting to go head on into business processes. We're going head on in how the business actually behaves, right? Especially because we map risk. So we, so we actually have a language of talking about that stuff. So we would create, so in my case, that would actually be either a fact or a vulnerability that that thing actually happens. So we actually will be able to prove Using the risk model, because okay, we now do scores on this, why, for example, that would be an accepted risk. Or actually, by the inefficiency of actually having to check in on this, doesn't make a difference because that's compensated by this thing over here. But what, what's interesting is when you think of it like a graph, those arguments become obvious. What, so what we do is we, we, we also introduce this concept I'll call a fact. So we actually have vulnerabilities, facts, and risks. And the facts allows us to make certain statements that then allows the conversations to occur allowed to understand why you do it. So the interesting fact is, why do you do that? And then you might say, well, we do it because we've always done it. And you go, fine, business owner, you have to accept that, right? And, and because it's a fact, right? And you have evidence that points to this. And actually, you might even have digital evidence that points to the thing. So now you play the game, right? And then you start to make it expensive for those processes to occur. But this happens everywhere, right? Like the workflow problems that you have in the business. So insecurity hits that all the time, right? We, we want to patch things, we want to change things, we want to implement things. Basically, we are a gigantic change machine to the business. We ask really hard questions as, what are you working on, right? What are you doing? You know, how does it work? What does it connect to? Right? What is the side effects of this? What does the architecture look like? Right? And not just what it looks like today, what it will look like tomorrow. Can we automate that part? Can we connect the owners? Who is actually responsible? Like, look at a bit of code and going, who's responsible for that bit of code? Right? That's a really hard question. Right? But we have a vulnerability on that bit of code, right? So 
You know, but you want to know that the moment you need to make a change to that bit of code or the moment you want to refactor, which is why usually you don't do that. You just invent something on the side because you can't figure out how to actually refactor this. So what I find interesting at, at, at the evolution of what we're doing now is we are now starting to move beyond security, but also even beyond sometimes technology, and now talk about the processes. So even get to the point where the next version of that bot is actually going to show you a little screenshot or a PDF, and then you're going to use the Slack bot, uh, Slack um, thumbs up and thumbs down and yes or no to actually make decisions, which is very powerful because it's a way to imagine delivering business intelligence reports like this. And imagine saying, here's a bot that allows you to ask questions on what kind of reports you want to do. Right? And then behind the scenes, you integrate this with all sorts of stuff. So I, one of the demos we did was actually to use the Elasticsearch machine learning to actually pick the outliers. And we actually score a screenshot in Slack of the machine learning of, Slack, of, um, of Elasticsearch, which is, which is really cool. But that almost democratizes that bit. So I always find that the way you drive change is not to argue about change. The way you, are, you, are, you, you, you drive change is you create a pocket where you control the environment, you behave in the new environment, and you slowly infect everybody else. And the logic is if your new way is that effective, it should work. That means that you guys use a new system and you are happier, you, you, know, you are faster, you're more efficient, and eventually the other crowd goes, well, well can, I, can I do that? Can I be part of that club? Right? So I always find that that exponential, again, going back to the Gen Z ideas, is that that exponential, little incremental changes is how you do change. You don't do it across the board, you do it bit by bit. And you do it in a way where you don't depend on others to make the change. So I would argue that you are a team of one, you can behave like this. You are a team of five, you can behave like this. You don't need you know, top management Approval, you just need a top manager to say, how, what do you want me to do? And then you code behind it. It's like the people says, I have to use SVN. You go, yes, but nobody told that you cannot use Git you know, on top of SVN, right? If you still want to commit in SVN, that's fine, but you should use Git because it's 10 times more effective, right? And you still have your big you know, commits, which, so it doesn't look any way different, right? But just, you just increase your productivity because you're now using Git versus SVN. So for me, that's the kind of thinking that you want that gives you this kind of speed, right? And, and technologies like you know, uh, Slack and, and Elasticsearch and Lambda or, or serverless make a gigantic difference because these reduces. Like the ability that I now have to spin up an analysis and then scale it up by 300 right, is incredible. Like we're actually having problems, sometimes we're having problems with Elasticsearch can't cope, right? So because we can actually now send so much data to that thing that is actually you know, uh, becomes a bottleneck, right? So. There's a disconnect to the company that has these kinds of checks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But this, yeah, but the way you do it, man, is you, you, you give them the risk, right? So, so the way we, we've done this, we say every, every behavior, so let's say that vulnerability is discovered. Oh, there's some keys here, right? On Active Directory. That's a vulnerability, right? We will then assign that to a technical owner that has to validate that that exists, but we will find whoever is the business owner of that system, and they have to accept the risk. Yeah. I, I work on BT, so I saw BT yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you need. I know, but that, that's why you need to reverse engineer, right? The solution and the facts, and then present them. I would argue that if you do that in a non-hyperlinked way, you end up with puzzle spreadsheets. Your data is not going to be accurate. It's not going to scale. If you can interconnect the, and deconstruct the arguments, then you end up having very rational ways to present that. And sometimes you need to let the business make mistakes because fundamentally it's their decision. Our job is to make sure that the facts are presented correctly and they understand the side effects of what they're doing. But I'm yet to see somebody that when you present the facts in certain ways, they actually choose wrongly, right? Especially when the, um, the end result and decisions are, are all kind of captured. It becomes really hard to hide 
when you can say, well, okay, here's the vulnerabilities and the risks and the implications of that solution and the cost, and here's the ones from the other solution, and by the way, here's the number of people that support that, now you make a call. And by the way, your decision is going to be captured and tracked to all this. We actually mean when this thing blows up, because it will, because we're telling you this is going to happen, we actually have a direct track to who make those calls. And maybe that was the right decision at that moment in time. That's fine. But that should also su survive the, the test of time, right? So I, I think that if you create a hyperlinked organization, you have a much more fact way and objective way to have those hard conversations, which are hard, right? And you, know, you have them everywhere. All right, so just wrapping up. So give me feedback on the book. So, uh, you just, so I got some copies on the book here, and I'll talk about it in a second. So you can get the book from LeanPub. And again, from a publishing point of view, you guys can do this. You can actually choose to pay zero if you want, right? Because uh, for me, I still I want to get feedback. You can get it from GitHub. All the data is there. You can actually get all the content. You can download the latest version. You can actually all get some issues. And, and the thing about this, right, is so my thing here is you can take a book, right, I got, if you send me a pull request. Right? So the book still has lots of bugs, right? has lots of issues. Right? I'm still working on the next version. Right? And you can see the pull request can be simple comments and some other things, or just a simple spelling mistake. Right? So, you know, and so this is kind of like how I developed this, because my, my view is that you know, I want to just get out there, and, um, and I'm still kind of improving it. So, uh, and you can see, so if you never send a pull request, or, and this is where I always say there's a difference, is that when you can, again, when you think like this, it means that you're using Git, for example, to manage your content. It means you're using Git every day to manage the kind of stuff that you guys do. And that's, again, that's the difference between somebody who's already thinking at a different level or not. Or, or get your kids, right, to send me a pull request, right? And then make the change, right? You could also get on Amazon, right? And I want to just quickly talk about this because, so the workflow is really cool, right? The workflow is I publish to GitHub in Markdown. GitHub sends a hook to LinPub. LinPub pips it up. I can then publish on LinPub programmatic if I want, or once a couple of months. And then that gives me a print ready PDF that I up upload to Amazon. Right? Again, none, nothing of this costs me anything. I think LinPub now charges 50 bucks or 30 bucks for new book accounts. But apart from that, that's the holy thing. How much do you think? I'm, so at the moment, I have zero stock, right? I have no stock, but I have my book on Amazon. How much do you think Amazon charges me for this? Any idea? Yeah, but how much, what's, what's the unit of one cost of a book? So, sorry? Almost. But even at five pounds would be really cool, right? Because think about it, right? The biggest problem with publishing books, for example, was the, the one copy, right? Because I had to buy a thousand. Right? Or, or 500, right? That was, in fact, there was a whole business model of going to aspiring authors and going, hey, you get your book and just buy 500, right? Because the printing, so if you look, if you notice, every time you see printed in UK by Amazon in the back, this is a print on demand book. In fact, I got it to the point where I, I know this because I published it one day. I, would, I was able to get next day delivery on a book that I published the day before, right? So it takes Amazon less than a day to print a book, ship it to me, right? And they, they charge me £2.70 plus 40%, right? So the cost of printing this book is about £3, £2.70, and, and Amazon charges me 40% royalties on it, which when you compare with most other auth or book authors, right, and the deals you get is kind of, you know, pretty, it's a pretty good deal, right? And the interesting thing is available around the world. So this is the interesting thing, right? Like we went from a world where publishing a book was super complicated. Or you can actually publish a, something that comes from a markdown page that has, you know, looks pretty all right, right? That I have zero cost to publishing, right? That is now on a worldwide store available to be published. And in a lot of cases, a next day delivery. So the interesting question is why haven't you done it, right? And, and I want to, the, 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 some of the people I want to hire is the people that give me a book and say, by the way, and at that moment in time, I almost care less about the content than I care less, than I care about that person has figured out how to do all this stuff, right? And I guarantee that that person will be way ahead everybody else, most likely, all things considered, right, about that, you know, that you're interviewing. And that's, again, is that competitive advantage, is solving all those little problems that occur, right? <laughs> 
Now, the thing about this is I haven't got a lot of sales, but it doesn't matter, right? Okay, those are units and stuff like that. But an interesting here is that I, I chose, for example, to let the, what's it called, the price to be for free. So this is an interesting example of, of me saying, well, I want to release this thing in Creative Commons, and I think that I prefer my book to be out there than to actually limit the access to the book to somebody who maybe can't afford paying or doesn't feel comfortable paying, etc. So the, the point of this is to actually do it, is to actually go out there and to learn about you know, that kind of, you know, what is the process. And, and the irony of this is I actually learned a couple of things when I was doing this that I actually applied doing my, my, my day job. So it's almost like these, these things are always interconnected, right? <laughs> so again, I create a website. I even put some t-shirts and mugs, like this one you see here. I, I am because I code and stuff like that. And again, I have no stock. Right? So there you go, it's all print on demand, right? And it's pretty cool to experiment with this kind of stuff, right? And then, um, thank you. So cool. I've got to say, this book is a really, really easy read. You know, you'll, if you like me, you'll, you'll get through it in about three, four hours. And yep. kind of, hey, I know that. Um, I hope we got some cool ideas from it. Which is not normally a language for a networking company. They handed over the engagement to the account managers who are politicians essentially. Yeah. And they're trying to rip off our clients. Yeah. Because, and they're claiming Brexit. Mm -hmm. you know, well, for the reasons, Brexit. What do you think of all those, what, what, what impacts or all this uh, priori about uh, Britain leaving the EU or not leaving the EU? How about overall delivery services across the board with yeah. United? Would, you know, it, I, think, I think you're going to have an interesting opinion about his reaction. <laughs> on, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think nobody knows, right? I think it's, it's, it's a great, look, this is a good example. If you did the worldly map, right, of this, right? Without taking sides, right? The logic here is to, if you do a worldly map and says, what do you need? So the argument is that the country is better without Europe, right? That's fine. So what you're saying is that you, you basically assume that you have the negotiation capability to outsmart the rest of the world, which is fine, and you have the ability to create the deals and the ability to pull it off by yourself and the ability to play that game. So you require a certain level of craftsmanship, playmanship, right, intelligence, and ability to execute stuff, right? And, you know, 20 or 34 billion dollars <coughs> pounds to think, right? So that's fine, so you can assume that, and then you do the map and say, okay, the cool thing of a map, if you map that, right, and then suddenly you start to see lots of interesting dependencies there, because then you go, who do we actually have running this thing, right? And then you say, okay, now what about if we don't do that, right, and use the same capabilities, the same resources to negotiate inside Europe, for example, then you can play that game. But I think this is one of those examples where, you know, it's, it's sort of like, it's, 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 it's an idea that, you know, you can see that where, where it came, because I, I, so my, my point of view is I think it's, it's an anti-system uh, revolt that the system actually deserves because there's a huge, huge amount of inequality. My view is that I don't think the answer is to leave the EU, right? But, but sometimes you have to challenge the status quo. The problem is that the way it's been done about this is like, you know, it's kind of a slow motion car crash, right? Now, whether that will result in something good, I think we're, we're yet to see, right? But, No, nobody knows. Like, we, we actually have that question because we actually share a lot of stuff across Europe, right? But th this is the problem. Like, there's, there's even, even like, the problem is not the day after, right? Even whatever they're talking about. Like, these things are never that dramatic, right? Uh, is, is the long-term effects. That's the problem. So, you know, it's, even if some stuff happens now, like, come on, the system itself is pretty robust, right? The problem is, you know, what happens in the next six months, in a year, in two years, with, with that inflection, whatever that deal is, comes up, right? Yeah, so there you go. So 
So I, I take a, a risk-based approach to this. So we'll, we'll see. It's, I don't think it's going to be as bad as it could be, but I, 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 I feel it's a bad idea, right? But hey, um, some people think it's a great idea, right? So we have to explore it. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so is that actually working? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, as a, as a crib sheet, this is great. Um, they, you know, as, as developers in their um, 20s, 30s, 40s, we've all got, we've all got um, relatively the same triggers mm -hmm. about working through problems, cycling, iterating, mm -hmm. you know, being really, really happy at the end results. Um, based, on, based on, you know, some of the research that you've done uh, with yeah. your own kids, what do, you think, what do you think the triggers are for the next generation? Because from, from, my, from my learnings from my son, it's not, it's not the problem solving. It's not that the hardship of, of going through the pain of trying to get to something. It's that thing at the end, yeah. but without all the stuff in the middle, which was all the stuff that excited me when I was young, try, trying to deal with this. Yeah, I, I do think that the, the, the new generation has, you know, it is an interesting challenge because there's a, there's a degree of quality that some of the things they see that is so, you know, kind of, Evolves like the, the the apps they use and the maturity that they use. That it, sometimes it's hard to see that evolution. But, but I, I do think that the way, so the way I look at the generation is very interesting. It's, like it's actually one of the best generations that we had so far, right? So if you think about it, from a principles, diversity, creative thinking, um, you know, even learning, they they're really good. I think what we're now seeing is what our parents saw, right? Which is like, you know, the, the kids slumped in a sofa and do something with your life, that kind of stuff, right? But, 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 but I, I go back and I remember thinking, look, remember that for example, when we were young, right? The culture shock to our parents was like nothing to what we have, right? So imagine like rock and roll, sex pistols, right? The kind of, the, 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 the thinking of computing, which is like completely alien, right? So if you think the internet is bad, imagine, you know, our stuff, right? And all, you know, all the, the crazy things that we were doing at the time. Right? I think even the values, like at the time was like morality, right? You know, you go back a couple more hundred years or 500 years ago, well, so even 50, whatever, it would be like, you're now challenging the global laws of the universe and God and all that jazz, right? Like, so I think, I said I've seen that our kids are not rebel enough, right? Like they, they could be challenging you know, a lot more, right? But I think we're asking the, the wrong question, right? I feel that there, there is something that we need to find a way to block that kind of, that world that they, they've very curated. So that I agree. But I think the key is when you look at when they use Fortnite and, and Minecraft and the way they use the apps and for them, the way they care about privacy, right? So kids are a lot more privacy aware that people give them credit. There's a reason why Snapchat is so popular, right? Because it doesn't hold the freaking photos, right? So they're very aware of it, but they have, a lot of them haven't, haven't dealt with the consequences. But I do think that what we need to figure out a way is, is kind of a, a way to to change how we approach some of the problems because that generation is ready to kind of consume that. But if you look at the principles that they have, they are a lot more, sometimes conservative, like in, in well-behaved and, and, and kind of um, ability to accept change in a way that you know, we weren't, or, or, or some generations. Like, you know, my kids talk about somebody being gay and being this and being that. It's like, you know, it's not even a thing, right? It's actually, you know, just, just friends, right? And it's, it's really great, right? And multicultural and all that stuff. And, uh, I, but I do think that my worry is that if this generation doesn't get their heads around technology, right? So I, I worry about there's going to be a generation that's going to be stuck in the middle. There's going to be a generation that, if they're not careful, Right? The generation that comes before them has such a different level of tools and such a different level of thinking that literally they leapfrog them. Right? And in fact, one argument here is they could be much bigger than this. And if you read the guy who wrote the um, um, Homo sapiens, Homo Deus, and, talks, and the guy who uh, wrote the um, 21 rules for the uh, whatever new world, that's amazing, right? And, and what he talks about is that we might actually end up having what you call a, it's not a, a repress community or a repressed class, uh, we might have with a useless class, a class of people that actually, they can't do anything that a machine doesn't do better. So I do think that that's a massive problem, which is why I think that we need to make sure that we have a lot of, you know, much more access to technology and much more access to thinking, 
which, which is kind of what I'm, I'm trying to figure out here, is how to get the, the new generation, maybe the existing generations, to move away from you know, seeing coding and using technology as this really geeky stuff to actually something that they should be able to use you know, every day to automate their lives. But you see that, you see that kind of you know, spark when they solve problems, right? Like, you know, it's kind of like you, you see that. You see when they solve a problem, when they are getting into it. You know, when they get into something, they are able to get into that zone, right? And that's, I think that's what you, you want to do. I, I agree, and I think that, I mean, the, the benefit of, um, of games like Fortnite and, um, and uh, Minecraft is that it gives you that collaborative platform. Yeah. You know, just like, you know, just, just like we, we, when, we were, um, when, we, when we started out being programmers, we were doing extreme programming and test stream development, yeah. and we were, we were having that whole collaboration aspect of putting a project together. Yeah. Uh, the kids are doing the same, you know, they're building things or, yeah. you know, and they're doing it in their tribe, you know, mm -hmm. but it's completely inclusionary. There's nobody that's, that's ousted yeah. from this and yeah. um, so I do, I do think in that respect it's really good. But I, I think that it's, it's interesting that you go from, from Minecraft to, to Fortnite because one of, when we used to run the, the Minecraft sessions, um, it, it, was, it was a canvas for automation. You know, you could, get the, you could get the kids to program this yeah. and then understand that they could do things that they couldn't actually mm -hmm. do um, in the game, but maybe even do it better with, yeah, with yeah. code, automating turtles, all yeah. of these sort of things. And then they've moved from this very, very open environment to this closed environment, yeah. Fortnite, yeah. Um, where they can't do any of that. Yeah. And that, that's a shame, right? So I, I think it's interesting because you saw, you saw Facebook today, you know, like coming up with, with privacy, right, and stuff like that. And I, and I do think there's a certain types, there's a certain things in our society that we have to change fundamentally, right? One of them is access to data and the other one is openness, right? Like we can't allow walled environments to exist because the side effects of those are tremendous. Like the fact that we then allow, you know, and this is why, you know, regulation is good for this stuff because regulation allows you to correct things that the market doesn't go there. So Fortnite would not open up the environment because it's against the business model. But like you said, it creates an environment where now you can't go to the next level. The same thing that when Facebook was in, in the pure ad, you know, ad kind of world, they actually, the side effects, the ripple of society, of even, even the Google right, the environment is tremendous. So we now need to, I think, you know, have a complete different thinking of how we approach technology so that we force the openness of the system. And actually, machine learning is really interesting. I had a really cool panel the other day where the, the, the topic was that we have to understand how machine learning gets to make decisions. Because what happens is you can't have this black box making decisions that we don't understand, right? Because it's a problem. Because what happens is when it goes wrong, it goes wrong spectacularly. And then you don't even understand why it did. So I actually think that be able to reverse engineer decisions and the openness of how things work is not just something that it's good or it's hippie and we should do it because we live in open source. It's actually fundamental for us as a society to know where, where's our sense of gravity and how we want to live our lives, right? There you go. I think that's a nice way to end <laughs> the night. So thank you. So please take a book, right, and share it with you. By the way, this is all Creative Commons, right? So you, if you want, you can take this content, you can put a new cover, and you can even sell it if you want, right? My, my point is I want to share the ideas on this book, and I want to get feedback for the next version, and the wider um, this book is used, you know, that's, that's what I like about this stuff. So take a book, share it with your friends, right, and send me a pull request, right, and, uh, and some contributions and some ideas for making the next version better. Thank you.